Okay, welcome everybody. Um, welcome back from lunch as well, and to anyone that's coming in, welcome. Um, I'm excited to introduce our speakers today. Um, the pan this panel considers the structural roots of the social media crisis and what modes of governance we might need to put in place to serve the needs of a multiracial democratic society. In recent years, the for-profit model for social media has overseen the rise of algorithmically driven mis- and disinformation campaigns waged by foreign adversaries, the co-occurrence of networked surveillance and hyper-targeted uh, advertising models, and the rise of domestic radicalization campaigns, all of which have unsettling effects on the democratic process. Yet we've also seen the Arab Spring, Occupy, Black Lives Matter, Me Too, and countless other protest movements galvanize and organize on social media platforms. As a result of these events, we've also witnessed congressional hearings on disinformation, antitrust, platform transparency, data privacy, and national security, with executives from Facebook, Twitter, Google, and most recently TikTok being questioned about their platform's influence and interference in the democratic process. As such, this panel asks how might we use this moment to create social media platforms that serve the needs of a multiracial democratic society. And to that end, I'm really excited to introduce our speakers today. First, we'll hear from Sandeep Vahesan, who is legal director at Open Markets Institute. He works on a range of anti-monopoly topics, including antitrust role in structuring labor markets and promoting fair competition. He's written for The Atlantic, Harvard Law and Policy Review, The New York Times, The Washington Post, The Yale Law Re Journal Forum, among many other publications. Sandeep has a forthcoming book titled Democracy in Power with the University of Chicago Press on the history of public and cooperative power in the United States and the lessons that it offers for building a clean and publicly accountable electric indus industry today. Then we'll hear from Nathan Schneider, who is Assistant Professor of Media Studies at the University of Colorado Boulder. Nathan is author of three books and co-editor of the book on platform cooperatism, which came out of a pioneering conference of the same name that he co-organized in uh, 2015. Nathan has a forthcoming book on governable spaces with the University of California Press, which is an exploration of the models of democratic ownership and governance for online platforms. Then we'll hear from Charlton McIlwain, who is Professor of Media Culture and Communication at NYU's Steinhardt School for Ed Culture, Education and Human Development. And he is also co-founder of the Center for Critical Race and Digital Studies. Charlton is author of the new book, Black Software, which provides a wonderful history of the digitally mediated racial justice activism and organizing online and recovers some of the forgotten figures of internet history. Charlton is also co-author of the award-winning book, Race Appeal, How Political Candidates Invoke Race in U.S. Political Campaigns. And then we'll hear from our very own Sarah Jackson, who is the Presidential Associate Professor of Communication here at the Annenberg School for Communication and co-director of the Media Inequality and Change Center, our hosts today. Um, Sarah's first book, Black Celebrity, Racial Politics and the Press, examines the relationship between black celebrity, activism, journalism, and American politics. Her second co-authored book, Hashtag Activism, Networks of Race and Gender, Ju Gender Justice, focuses on the issues of, Twitter's, uh, of Twitter in contemporary social movements, which is uh, today gonna be an important topic of discussion. Um, she's also working on a third book on power and innovation of African-American media makers. Please welcome our guests. Thank you so much, Lauren, and thank you to Breyer, David, and Victor for organizing today's event and inviting me. I'm truly honored to be here and to be on this distinguished panel. I already realize my slides are quite dull compared to some of the other slides that have come before, but hope hope you don't hold that against me. Uh, so surveillance is really the lifeblood of the digital economy today, so I'll briefly define surveillance advertising, although I really don't need to define it for this audience. So various firms closely track what we do online and offline to figure out our needs, desires, anxieties, and fears. 
you know, all these smart devices, most notably smartphones, are means of collecting as much granular data about some slice of our life as possible to figure out who we are, what we might buy, what we might join, what we might support. And I knew something was changing about 10 years ago when my parents went to Lowe's to buy a new water heater and the salesperson said, you know, there's a traditional water heater, there's a smart water heater. I was like, what, what's the point of buying a smart water heater? And it took me years to appreciate why everything was becoming smart. Uh, the salesman, to his credit, said, don't waste your money on a smart water heater, just get the regular one. So digital companies build detailed profiles on each of us and figure out what we might be interested in. So they can tell Abbott Labs who might be interested in purchasing baby formula, or Honda, who might be in the market for a small SUV. In theory, this business model is far more precise than traditional mass media, such as TV, radio, billboards, and newspapers. So compared to Facebook, Google, TikTok, the cable company, TV channels, and newspapers know far less about each of us, although they're also trying to learn as much as they can about us. And this is a huge business. Uh, I'm going to quote uh, from the Department of Justice's January antitrust complaint against Google. They have a nice excerpt on how big surveillance advertising is today. So the DOJ writes, website publishers in the United States sell more than five trillion, T, trillion with a T, digital display advertisements on the open web each year, or more than 13 billion advertisements every day. The sheer volume of these online ads makes the offline advertisements of yesteryear pale in comparison. To put these numbers in perspective, the daily volume of digital display advertisements grossly outnumbers by several multiples the average number of stocks traded each day on the New York Stock Exchange. As I mentioned, this is most famously done by fa Facebook and Google, but there are hundreds if not thousands of other businesses involved in surveillance advertising. So why should we be concerned about surveillance advertising? So I would submit that there are at least four evils associated with surveillance advertising. The first is probably the most familiar one. Surveillance advertising is built on systematic invasions of our privacy. In the sense, it really never ends. Everything we do is tracked. Even when we are ostensibly offline, we are online thanks to smartphones and GPS. So for example, our smartphone likely knows when we go to McDonald's and depending on how we placed our order might even know whether we got a Big Mac, Quarter Pounder, or a Mech Chicken. So this Business model is synonymous with privacy in invasions. That's the first evil. The second evil is it facilitates illegal discrimination on a large scale. So discrimination is another word for targeting. Some of this targeting could be innocuous. If I've been researching life on the West Coast recently, I might understandably get ads about housing in San Francisco or job opportunities in Los Angeles. But this discrimination can also be pernicious and illegal. So under the Civil Rights Act of 1964, businesses cannot discriminate on the basis of race, color, creed, gender, sexual orientation, just to name a few protected categories. So surveillance advertising can facilitate illegal forms of discrimination. For example, an employer might say, I only want to post a certain job listing to white males between the age of 40 and 60. But it can also oper operate more insidiously through something called disparate impact. So in American society today, personal identity such as race, color, creed, national origin are generally correlated with things such as income, wealth, credit, credit scores, zip code. So using these ostensibly neutral measures, firms can actually end up engaging in illegal discrimination. So advertisers may not be saying explicitly we only want to reach whites or males, but by relying on these other measures, they may engage in conduct that has a disparate impact and that is still illegal under federal civil rights laws. That of course may change. You know, the disparate impact theory appears to be falling out of favor with this current Supreme Court and I certainly wouldn't bet money that disparate impact claims are viable five or ten years from now. But either way, surveillance advertising can facilitate large-scale illegal discrimination. Third, the business model is dependent on psychological manipulation for two reasons. So the more online we are, the more ads these companies sell. But also the more online we are, the, mo the more they learn about us, the more about our hopes, fears, wants, and desires. So there's a 
they have a business interest in promoting clickbait or addictive content. And that should be deeply concerning. You know, we've heavily, heavily regulated smoking because smoking and tobacco are addictive. I think we should be thinking about surveillance advertising from a similar perspective. And last but not least, I would argue that surveillance advertising is a massive waste of resources. So why are some of our best engineering minds and huge quantities of energy being used to target advertising more precisely than ever? What is the social benefit? I'm old enough to remember a world before the internet, before surveillance advertising. My parents never had difficulty finding a good place to eat or where to buy a car or where to get a nice pair of leather shoes. We had plenty of marketing material and content available to us in 1995. The idea that we need surveillance advertising to serve consumers is a little bit far-fetched. And uh, Julia Angwin actually had a very timely piece in the New York Times uh, just yesterday reporting on research that finds that surveillance advertising isn't actually serving consumers despite what its proponents claim. Uh, she wrote, the targeted ads shown to another set of nearly 500 participants were pitching more expensive products from lower quality vendors than identical products that showed up in a simple web search. So it's not even serving consumers despite what Google and Facebook say. So I think these are four reasons we should be deeply concerned with and if not outright opposed to surveillance advertising as practiced and really perfected by Google and Facebook. So for these reasons, I think we should think of surveillance advertising as a form of unfair competition. Uh, digital advertising now accounts for more than 60% of total ad spending in the United States. Facebook and Google have about 50% of that 60%, though they've recently lost market share to Amazon and TikTok. That's a fact we should bear in mind when we hear about calls for banning TikTok. What's the, what's the sudden motivation for banning a company that engages in the same business model as its homegrown competitors, Facebook and Google? So what are the practical consequences of surveillance advertising? It sucked tens of billions of dollars out of traditional media, which relied on advertising to support their business. And the decline of journalism, not just in the United States, but across the world, means uh, loss of investigative journalism, the disappearance of things like labor beat reporters and foreign bureaus, and of course in many communities, the outright death of journalism. Many communities simply no longer have a daily newspaper. Of course, some people might say, that, well, this is just an example of the dynamism of the American economy. This is Schumpeterian creative destruction. Uh, I would argue that's wrong for at least two reasons. So the first is a familiar one. Journalism serves an important public function. We need a vibrant fourth estate in a democratic society. And this is not to idealize advertising-supported journalism. It has its own problems. But given the choice between ad-supported journalism and no journalism, I think the former is superior. The second reason is competition is not a free-for-all. Businesses not, are not at liberty to compete as they wish. So take some familiar examples, supporting the idea that competition is a process structured by law. So for example, firms cannot compete using false advertising, commercial bribery, and industrial sabotage. And one of the United States' main federal antitrust laws, the FTC Act, prohibits unfair methods of competition. Congress deliberately used the term unfair to show that there are good and bad forms of competition, and we distinguish between the two using popular common notions of morality. So given these reasons, we should restrict, if not prohibit, surveillance advertising as an unfair method of competition. It invades our privacy, facilitates all forms of, many forms of illegal discrimination, encourages addictive, provocative content, and constitutes a massive waste of resources. And we indeed may be on the cusp of a radical restructuring of the digital economy. Uh, for instance, last summer, the Federal Trade Commission published an advance notice of proposed rulemaking on commercial surveillance, which suggests that the Federal Trade Commission is interested in cracking down on this business model. We're also hearing about bills in Congress, some of which have bipartisan support to restrict, if not prohibit, surveillance advertising. And we're seeing similar efforts at the state level. We can talk about the politics behind some of these unusual political coalitions. So what would this mean if regulators or Congress prohibit surveillance advertising? Companies would be forced to find better, more socially beneficial business models. In some cases, companies will simply go out of business. And that's not something we should lament. Businesses have no right to exist. Nobody today is 
lamenting the decline of asbestos mining. That was best for society. Then others, I'll be honest, I think Facebook and Google fall into the second category. We'll find other ways of making money. For example, they might turn to contextual advertising. Uh, so for example, if I'm reading a story about last night's Sixers game, I'm actually not sure if the Sixers played last night, um, I might see an ad for a cable package that allows me to watch all 82 six, uh, regular season games featuring the Sixers. So contextual advertising would still be would still be permissible and legal following a crackdown on surveillance advertising. The other business model could be subscription fees, much like Netflix. We pay a modest sum to either access Google and Facebook or receive more advanced premium services on these sites. That's only part of the story, uh, unfair competition. Uh, outlawing surveillance advertising would certainly lead to a significant improvement over the status quo, but. I have no illusions about its limits. It's not going to solve all the problems of the internet. If we just did that, Mark Zuckerberg and Sergey Brin would still be in charge, and that should be deeply concerning to us. The second aspect we should be thinking about is who governs these digital firms. Uh, this is a general problem in American corporate law. It's not restricted to the, to the digital sector. In most cases, businesses are controlled by controlling shareholders, uh, either individuals or groups who have a significant stake in, their, in, in a company. Sometimes it can be 50.1%, but in other cases, a 10 or 15% equity stake is sufficient to exercise control. Um, I should also mention, and I'll get to this in a moment, uh, creditors often wield important governance too through bond covenants whereby they require a company to do something or refrain from doing something else. And I think Elon Musk's takeover of Twitter uh, really illustrates the shortfalls and deficiencies of shareholder supremacy. You know, Twitter has become qualitatively worse since he took over the company. It's clunky, cluttered with ads and reactionary content. And of course, this week, uh, Twitter symbol was replaced with Doge. So Twitter embodies you know, modern corporation as the plaything of wealthy people. And the reason I mentioned creditors and their governance power earlier is Musk is an infantile, irresponsible, and generally bigoted person, but I think the fact that he's deeply in debt is compounding some of his existing pathologies. He's trying to figure out how to monetize this business. He recognizes that he overpaid for it and now wants to extract as much money as possible so he can at least service his debt, uh, if not make some money. What this means for us, though, is Musk make, makes all the important decisions, and the rest of us, whether we're users of Twitter or employees of Twitter, have little or no say in its management. As I said, this is a general problem in American corporate law, but I think it's especially acute when we're talking about social media, other digital firms that present themselves as quasi-public spaces, are treated by their users as public spaces, and yet function as autocracies of finance. Uh, you could think of it as a co-governance structure between equity and debt. So what are some alternatives to this? Um, uh, sorry, I'm actually one slide behind. Um, so we have a couple of options. Co-determination is a familiar model, uh, maybe made most famous in Germany, where large corporations have to set aside a certain fraction of their board to worker representatives. We also have cooperatives, such as credit unions, where consumers stand in the place of shareholders, elect the board, vote on important policy decisions, and are, and are entitled to the cooperative surplus. We should be talking about these alternative business models uh, online, but also elsewhere in the economy. It's, it's long past due to re reconsider the framework of shareholder supremacy. And a point I should have made earlier is you know, shareholders are often presented as investors, but in most cases, sharehold shareholders actually contributed nothing to the firm. They purchased stock on the secondary market. They didn't actually contribute any capital to investment or the development of new products. So shareholders have had a number of very effective, powerful propagandists, but we should reject their self-conception and understand them for what they are. People who purchase paper, can sell paper at any time and have comparatively loose and weak ties to a firm compared to workers, users, and communities. And if we are serious about promoting these alternative business models, I think finance is really the key. So I've been reading a lot of modern monetary theory, I've arguably been MMT pilled. Uh, so long as firms are dependent on Goldman Sachs and Bank of America for financing, it's very unlikely we're going to see a proliferation of alternative democratic business models. 
at least not functionally. We might have some paper cooperatives, but these institutions will fundamentally be embedded in existing systems of domination and private control. So what's really important is talking about and promoting public financing. Uh, Chris talked about the Rural Electrification Administration in his presentation, so the REA extended low-cost credit to rural electrification projects in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, and successfully electrified the countryside. Uh, only about 1 in 10 farmers had power in 1935. That number was almost 9 in 10 by the mid-1950s. We have other examples, such as the Small Business Administration. And notably, in the 2022 Inflation Reduction Act, Congress set aside tens of billions of dollars, not just in loans, but also in grants to support decarbonization efforts, including through publicly owned and cooperatively owned institutions. So we have existing models. What I'm describing is not utopian, but rather, um, I think, practical and in some ways modest extensions of what we already have in the United States. So I realize I might be going over. I'll just wrap by saying, you know, we should reject the idea that technology dictates certain institutional arrangements. I was in a, at an event about a month ago where someone said, you know, I recognize Amazon is problematic in a number of ways, but my family and I love buying things on Amazon. It's so convenient and affordable. Are you suggesting we go return to an era of uh, offline commerce and have to buy everything in brick and mortar stores? And I think that reflected a classic conflation of technology, selling goods online versus an institutional arrangement, Amazon as a, fin as a financialized corporation. Amazon became what it is because of policy choices made by Congress, bureaucrats, and the courts. Nothing about it was inevitable. And I believe going forward, we can have an online sphere that is fair and democratic, but only if we want it and recognize the political fights that we require to get there. Thank you. Thank you so much for the opportunity to be part of this discussion. It's really a dream come true. Um, I want to start with a couple of epigraphs from articles uh, from 2020 on the um, topic of so-called cancel culture. The first is from media scholar Meredith Clark. She writes, the absence of deliberation in chastising bad actors misconstrued as the outcome of cancel culture is a fault of the elite's inability to adequately conceive of the impact social media connectivity has for shifting the power dynamics in the public sphere in the digital age. The second comes from uh, activist and writer Adrienne Marie Brown, who I'm in my uh, next book kind of turning into a media scholar um, uh, uh, because I find her thinking so useful for us. Um, she writes, the tools of swift and predatory justice feel good to use, familiar, groove in the hand easily from repeated use and training, briefly satisfying. But these tools are often blunt and senseless. And I think it's worth noting, too, that Brown is part of a, a movement of transformative justice activists, people seeking to, um, uh, uh, to create systems of uh, accountability and conflict resolution that uh, do not rely on police and incarceration and state violence. And in that movement, uh, one often finds um, an insistence that social media spaces are inappropriate and inadequate for the kinds of processes that they hope to create. I'm going to offer a bit of a story about um, you know, part of why that is. Um, and it's a story about. Uh, uh, political economy, but also technical design and how these things uh, interact and uh, are, have contributed to producing, I think, a diminished set of possibilities for democratic futures um, that, that we need to be attentive to. And what the premise here, or an observation, is that there is really just one way that power tends to flow online in our intimate online spaces in the Facebook groups, in the chat uh, threads, in the, um, you know, the various uh, apps that we use to communicate in groups. There's really just one way it works. Um, it's what I've called implicit feudalism. Authority derives from founders or server admins and their delegates. 
There's an opacity to um, policy making if there is in fact any kind of policy that is entirely optional and decision making processes. And suppression of user voice is the basic privilege of authority. This is something that we uh, find going back to the earliest BBS systems in the 1970s and 80s. And it's a pattern that's been inherited through a complex of uh, a technical habit and also legal liability um, across our social spaces. So this is the basis upon which online uh, communities form and operate. This is how we are being taught to um, and learning uh, through practice to do community life online. I argue in uh, work I've been doing over the last few years that this actually, far from being simply a matter of technical convenience, is actually contributing to the rise of interest in authoritarian politics and the decline of uh, uh, hope and, and in democratic possibilities in many different contexts around the world. That we're extending essentially a logic of um, of homesteading, the logic of colonization into online space, where the, the premise of a, a, a promised democracy is the enactment of local authoritarianism, um, practice in, in Western American homesteading through the patriarchy of the, of the landowner uh, taking indigenous land, and extended to uh, the administration of online spaces. Um, with a kind of uh, fractal relationship between the individual communities that we might participate in and then the companies as a whole, up to cases like Meta, where you have a very unusual arrangement where a single person, Mark Zuckerberg, holds a controlling, uh, was permitted by Wall Street to hold a controlling um, interest in the, um, in the company. In the process, we're crowding out the richness of historical governance legacies. I think this is really important, and this is something that we often don't appreciate. The way in which we come from many different cultures and inheritances of how to do self-governance. You know, the recent popularity of the uh, Graeber and Wengro book, The Dawn of Everything, I think is a reflection of that, that sense of forgetting and, and re-recognition that, in fact, Human history is full of diverse governance practices that we can learn a great deal from and that, that often are alive and well in our offline spaces, but that we've lost uh, when we move into online life. And a big part of like the motivation for this project overall has been like my conversations with my mother in her, while well, she's been uh, 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 working as a, or, or, or was elected president of her, her local garden club. And in hearing her describe that experience, I, I, and I was tearing my hair out trying to run a 500-person email list of people obsessed with democracy and completely unable to figure out how to implement democracy in that space, made me realize just how much a lot of really sensible practices of offline governance um, are being forgotten as we move online. And part of that is because the tools we are presented with do not give us uh, 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 the means to implement these structures, the means to implement uh, the, the richness of, our, uh, of the legacies that we might inherit. Um, so one project that um, I, I've been uh, uh, working on to, you know, to try to address this is, is developing a concept and practice of uh, what I and my collaborators call governance archaeology, thinking about how do we re-represent and uh, reconnect relationships with uh, governance practices, particularly those that have been suppressed. On the one hand, um, I think there is an important, again, technical design component here. Uh, I don't think it's all political economy. I think there's, there's a kind of uh, latent creativity that we could be uh, delving more deeply into in designing systems uh, better attuned for for online democracy. Uh, five years ago, I co-founded a, um, a cooperative using the open source Twitter alternative Mastodon. Um, uh, it's called uh, social.coop. 
in order to develop a self-governing community uh, in that space, we had to use about five other platforms for fi managing finances, for decision making, for um, keeping documents to explain what counts as a decision for the community, fiscal sponsorship, um, and, and tech development, and real-time chat for operations. That's how hard it is to um, bend over backwards to the point where you can actually do recognizably democratic practices that look something like my mother's garden club. Mm -hmm. The tools we have right now are really, really poorly um, equipped for this stuff. So with my colleagues at the Meta Governance Project, we've outlined a framework called modular politics for what we should expect of um, the technical design of online spaces. Modularity should be able to connect and, um, and, and, and assemble systems based on smaller units of operations. Um, expressiveness, again, the capacity to express a wide range of governance legacies. Portability, the ability to move functionality from one space, uh, from one kind of context to another. And interoperability, a recognition that governance is always, as uh, Eleanor Ostrom put it, polycentric. Um, that governance is always an integration of many different governance spaces, and we need to um, design for that as well. Toward this end, um, in my lab, we've been developing a game mod uh, for, for online games that um, implements this framework, as well as a web interface called Community Rule that is an attempt to enable people to more easily design a kind of simple bylaws for online communities. Um, and now we're beginning a research project looking at attention economies in these spaces, um, partly informed by work going on in, um, in the world of blockchain and crypto, which for all of its profound failings is actually um, the first time that there have been online spaces that people kind of have to co-govern by default. And so as a result, in the midst of all the kind of scammy and and, and horror stories, there's actually a kind of flourishing of development of tools and interfaces for online governance of a kind that we've never really had before, partly because we haven't been able to have it. Um, finally, I think it's really critical to develop policy strategies to encourage um, what I think of as governable spaces as the eminent places to solve problems for online life. Rather than thinking about our policy making in top-down models, to think of it in terms of ins uh, inserting and instilling and encouraging self-governance um, across our networks. Um, and by policy, I mean not just policy in terms of law, um, but also policy in terms of the policies uh, written in code. And I think it's so important to recognize how, for instance, a company like OpenAI uh, began with a, a, an intent to um, restrict the capacity of profit motives to, uh, uh, to, to encroach on its decision making and has had to essentially erode those, um, those protections. And um, you know, above all, I want to echo what Sandeep said. We need to have a generalized financing framework designed to support community ownership because community ownership is a necessary basis of community governance. Um, and we need to think about this in as many contexts as possible. Connect the discussion from, from this morning to the discussion right now. Um, recognize that, that enabling this kind of policy, this kind of financing framework should not be a piecemeal activity, but should be connective so that communities everywhere, whether they're workers in a company, users on a social media platform, neighbors um, underserved in broadband, are able to access capital to uh, deploy reasonable um, services for themselves that they can co-own and co-govern. Um, thank you very much. Um, this is ongoing work at the Meta Governance Project, which is uh, like this big online community of people obsessed with online governance. Um, we're doing a lot of stuff at my lab at CU, and then uh, finish, I'm finishing up now a forthcoming book, assembling this narrative. Um, into some kind of sense. Thank you all so much.
Um, so I've got a few things I'm going to talk about be a lot less uh, coherent than the first two presentations and looking at some of the questions that uh, was asked as part of the description of this panel. Um, and so what I want to offer is just a few observations about um, the problem and sort of the framing of several of the problems. And then um, intent, I had intended to talk about a, a few uh, sort of policy uh, prescriptions, particularly related to one aspect of this, which is the uh, sort of algorithmic discrimination in the ad tech. Uh, but I may just skip over to a uh, kind of a concluding provocation. Um, so we'll see what happens. So um, in thinking about platform decline, Sorry, I didn't push the button, did I? Okay, <laughs> got it. Um, everyone hear me now? Okay, all right. Um, so number one, uh, today's social media platforms offer the illusion of community without the stability of mutual aid, care, or economic sustainability. Um, so what I'm offering is uh, different versions of what was uh, just said actually in uh, a couple of the pre presentations. That is that platforms today <clears throat> don't provide the kind of intimacy um, of prior online communities. Uh, and here I'm thinking about some of the ones that I um, know best, which are um, pre-internet or uh, beginning internet types of communities like uh, an Afronet, uh, a BBS community uh, that made its way slowly into the web era but um, ended very quickly. Um, and these communities thrived uh, for, for a couple of reasons. Number one, they privileged community. Uh, they didn't privilege uh, action. They didn't pri privilege politics. They privileged simply being with and among um, one another. Um, the other reason that they thrived was because they were fortified by some sense of uh, offline engagement. And so in the case of something like Afronet, um, connection to even uh, membership in the community was predicated on uh, terrestrial presence. One had to, uh, number one, prove you were indeed black because it was a black only space and community. Um, but also they were uh, full of occasions for offline gathering. And that was part of the online community was to be with and uh, among each other offline and so you had folks like Anita Brown who ran an early network um, and a, a web presence called Black Geeks Online. Um, and one of the things that they did often was to have an annual uh, set of gatherings sometimes in exotic locations, uh, frequently beaches along the East Coast, um, often through things like rent parties that would get online folks that had been connecting in the same place with each other, but for the benefit of each other in the ways that rent parties and similar types of mutual aid were um, set up. And so I think both of these uh, examples, among uh, many others, created the conditions in which mutuality could be transferred into mutual aid when necessary. Uh, and the two are necessary con conditions for uh, mutuality. And so. My point is simply that uh, today's platforms masquerade as communities, but users move out or decline their participation when there are uh, few means for economic sustainability within a community. That is, um, people not finding the ability uh, through the affordances of the tool uh, to have occasions to support one another, primarily economically, um, and in other ways as well. Sarah and I were uh, I don't know, a month or so ago at uh, uh, what was billed as a Black Twitter Summit. And one of the things that um, uh, was very apparent in that conversation that had a number of academics like uh, Sarah and I, but other uh, members of Black Twitter community uh, that were very prominent were the ways in which um, the idea of mutual aid and using the tool was a target of um, uh, disregard, of uh, violence, et cetera, um, that was generated not only by the presence of certain people in the community, but also the affordances of the, the, the tool. Um, 
So I'll wrap, on, wrap up on that point. The privileging of community is one of the pathways, I think, back to an egalitarian internet, and I think it connects to some of the earlier ideas from the first panel about, uh, about localism, about bespoke platforms that are really uh, uh, models for what could be uh, part of the future of a more egalitarian um, internet. The second observation is about algorithmic discrimination uh, through content suppression uh, that persistently sidelines black and brown creators from the platform economy. Um, so everything, this is all, you know, nothing new for most of us in this room, uh, everything from YouTube to TikTok to Instagram, Netflix, platforms that privilege white content, white people, white distribution networks whose um, uh, worst forms of work are discriminatory and in discriminatory in the worst ways in that they are seduced into, again, a type of illusion of participation without the actual promise of either visibility, let alone amplification. Um, continuing in the same vein, a third one beyond this kind of platform redlining, uh, platforms are implicated in uh, a term called reverse redlining or as has been just talked about, racial targeting. Um, the racial exclusion from full participation in the platform economy uh, in that platforms are key nodes in the advertising distribution networks that perpetuate persistent practices of identifying black and brown people and communities um, algorithmically through either geolocation or other means of algorithmic racial profiling and blanketing, blanketing those communities with advertisements for products and service, services that disproportionately negatively affect people and communities of color. And so social media platforms in, in some cases have directly facilitated some types of exclusion through their own advertising platforms. Facebook, of course, is uh, probably the best known, enabling racial discrimination by allowing advertisers to construe their own audiences through explicit racial attributes or potential proxies. And in other cases, they aid and abet predatory inclusion by serving up ads or increasing search visibility for products that are themselves predatory. Um, and so some of this comes from uh, recent work uh, for PolicyLink that I hope will see the light of day one day. Um, it was supposed to come out in like November. Um, Testing this uh, kind of scenario and trying to understand algorithmic uh, targeting um, in our current ad tech landscape uh, to try to understand and uh, tinker with models of how um, this kind of race-based targeting is done in algorithmic uh, advertising systems. Um, and the point of that was to, to do two things. Number one, to come up with models that help us to still understand how targeting takes place um, in a massive uh, complex system that was uh, described, I think, very well uh, earlier in terms of its scope and scale. Um, the other was to try to think about uh, a system of accountability whereby we can trace everything from A to Z, that is the uh, targeting as a beginning point on through the advertising displays or uh, search um, visibility, et cetera, on through the purchase of products, on through uh, what could be and often are uh, a number of harms when it comes to varying types, types of predatory uh, products. In that uh, case that uh, I was dealing with, it was around predatory lending and looking at advertising in that particular space, which is uh, known uh, for a long time to be very uh, discriminating um, and discriminatory in a disparate way uh, towards African American communities in particular and other communities of color. So I end that paper with a number of potential policy uh, prescriptions that I think have some viability um, to a certain degree, um, but I think I'll end up not with talking about those but I think going to um, another provocation that I think brings into, current, brings into focus some of what was mentioned earlier in terms of 
uh, the contradictions in policy around things like access and inclusion and so forth, um, and suggest that there is something, even before we get to policy prescription, something that we, uh, I think, have to increasingly confront. And I'm going to introduce that with a uh, reading just a, a paragraph or two of one of my favorite um, op-eds that's from 1967 by civil rights activist Roy Wilkins, uh, who writes quite a bit about the introduction of the computer automation, particularly in the scope and of the, the labor uh, force and its potential effects on black people. Um, and so I won't give the full context, but read a couple of the paragraphs that end with the point I want to make. <clears throat> Wilkins says and uses as a point of comparison uh, and, me and, and uh, metaphor, um, farm workers. And so he writes, for the Negro former farm worker, the computer is but one more signal that he has been kept at arm's length while the rest of America pressed forward into the computer era. In the mass, he never got a chance to acquire the learning and the skills which would have enabled him to progress toward the use of data processing. He was not without ambition or initiative, but whenever he tried to move, he was slapped down. In 1919, for example, Arkansas Negro sharecroppers in Phillips County had their meeting shot up. When they shot back, the state militia began killing Negroes at will under the guise of suppressing an insurrection. And it's these next words that I think is what we have to confront. Wilkins says, it was not intended that these black farmers should be permitted to take even the first step towards better farming and bigger earnings and right there is where the American system of individual enterprise and reward on the basis of ability broke down. It is precisely at this point in thousands of family histories that the difference between opportunities for the unskilled white immigrant and those of the unskilled black American became manifest. And so I think simply we have to confront increasingly more and more the proposition that it is not intended and then fill in the, in the blank, when we're, whether we're talking about access for black and brown people, whether we're talking about the ability for black and brown communities to have uh, the ability to thrive in a digital economy, uh, whether that's through entre entrepreneurship um, or other forms of engaging uh, the digital economy. And so what does it mean for our future policy and otherwise if our intention is not fully to grant opportunity and equality through uh, the digital technological landscape. Thank you. Okay, I'm up. This, thanks everyone for being here and sticking with us. This is a fun group of people because there are several people in the room Hi, Anthony, I see you over there hiding in the corner, who have known me since graduate school, including Charlton. So um, that's fun. So I want to start with a provocation that I think a handful of people in the room have maybe, maybe heard me say before, but I've whispered it, which is that Twitter is dead. But that actually, Twitter was dead before Elon. Um, and m the reason that I start there is that um, as somebody who wrote a book about Twitter and the potentials for social justice activism and social change through Twitter as a technology, I was inundated with, as you can imagine, more questions about how terrible Elon Musk was um, about in relation to Twitter than I had ever been asked about anything else about Twitter. Um, and I frequently disappointed journalists by saying, well, actually, even before Elon took over, the model of Twitter, which was becoming an increasingly elite space from, from what it looked like when it started, and a space that was increasingly about broadcasting messages as opposed to having communal and conversational messages, which was more like what it was when it started, was already decreasing the potentials for its use for the types of organizing and social change that I have studied. So I'm going to start there and then add a few other things. So I um, 
my, my work primarily focuses on thinking about and researching counter publics, and I apologize for the students in the room who have taken my class on counter publics because they're gonna have to listen to me define counter publics for the hundredth time. Um, but for those folks who are unfamiliar with the concept of counter publics, counter public comes out of critical theorizations that take up Habermas's sort of idealized political framework of the public sphere, which theoretically grants access to all citizens and becomes a space in which we can engage in deliberation and debate collectively to improve and extend and expand democracy. And of course, we appreciate Habermas for that, and his intentions were good, but this has never existed in any uh, current nation in the world uh, because there have always been built-in inequalities in which some people were not considered citizens, first off, so were not granted access to the spaces of deliberation and debate and, and democratic governance, um, but also you know, add in the fact that many of the people who were defining the terms of deliberation and debate and democratic governance owned other people, believed in manifest destiny, you know, thought women were hysterical, and et cetera. And what it means is that you know, we've never actually had a public sphere before or after the internet um, that has allowed the kind of democratic deliberation and debate that we've idealized. And so scholars of counter publics who largely come out of um, feminist uh, uh, frameworks, feminist media frameworks like Nancy Fraser, um, and black um, critical scholarship like um, the Black Public Sphere Collective and Catherine Squires said, all this is true, we've never actually had a democratic public sphere. However, what we know is that counter publics, these groups on the margins, have not lacked agency. So even though they've been excluded, they have been creating spaces for deliberation and debate that are alternative and often more close, closer to a democratic spaces for deliberation and debate than what existed in the mainstream. And these spaces have always used media and always created media and always taken up technology just as much as ha they have been taken up in the mainstream spaces. So sort of the classic examples, and we were just talking about this during the break, you know, if you take up the black press, the historical black press as an example of the sort of media and technology that a counter public that had been excluded from um, what were primarily white institutions of deliberation and debate, um, it, you know, created and created a thriving and very generative space for the for the generation of black politics. For example, in the 1970s, people of, often use the example of the feminist press, or even earlier than that, the suffragist press, right, as other examples of the ways in which counter publics have taken up technologies and. Here you have to give, grant me that the printing press is the technology, which it is, uh, have taken up technologies to intervene in and create alternative spaces for deliberation and debate. Okay, so thinking about counter publics and the digital then has led me into um, a lot of really interesting conversations like this one with either people who are um, often with people who are techno-determinists, but generally people who are either digital optimists or digital pe pessimists. So you all remember early on, there was this digital optimism that the internet was going to create finally this idealized public sphere. We were all going to be able to have access. You could say whatever you want. You could write whatever you want. Now everybody's voices would be heard. Okay, that's not realistic. We all know why. We've been talking all day about sort of the structures and conditions that have you know, prevented that from, from being reality. Infamously in 2010, Malcolm Gladwell, who I'm not a fan of, sorry, um, <laughs> wrote uh, an editorial, I think, I can't remember if it was for The Atlantic or for The New Yorker magazine or something that was called Small Change. And it was basically an argument about how um, not only were digital optimists wrong, but the internet and in fact digital technology could never be used to create the sort of widespread social change that people were hoping for. And the irony was that I think like six months later the Arab Spring happened. And of course the internet, just to be clear, did not in, by any stretch of the imagination create the Arab Spring, right? It was simply used as a tool among many other tools by people on the ground who are engaged in you know, using what was available to them, right? Um, but it did um, sort of challenge the idea that it couldn't be used in progressive ways. Okay, so given all that background, um, in, in my work thinking about researching counterpublics, um, I've always been thinking about how ordinary people 
um, have innovatively used technologies even under pernicious and hostile circumstances, right? The internet itself was designed as a military technology. Um, I would argue that its origins were not only militaristic, but violent and colonial. And yet we have seen the ways in which um, groups at various stages have used it towards resistance. Of course, as that has changed conditions of late stage capitalism and neoliberal globalization have sort of changed the ways that are, the things that are possible for these groups. So earlier this week here at Annenberg, we hosted um, UL Roth, I don't think it's a secret, the former trust and safety head at Twitter. Um, and one of the issues um, that uh, he raised was the issue of loss of academic access to Twitter data, um, which is one of the many sort of autocratic decisions that Musk has made. Um, and I actually, Lauren gave me this prompt before, so I apologize because I think this is one of the questions she was going to ask me. But. <laughs> um, but I wanted to take that up in thinking about how we as scholars, which I think most folks in this room are, are thinking about studying some of these questions. So obviously it's important to me because I've done this kind of research with a focus on activist politics and organizing on Twitter. Um, you know, the question of how might the lack of free access to Twitter's API affect knowledge production is very complicated, um, but it's also connected to the question of how might social organizing be shifting or not, have, not shifting through these online spaces. So this access hasn't been important because while there is obviously a lot of very valid and important critique about the harms and failures and promises of corporate social media, um, having access to this site has allowed ordinary people to innovate new forms of primarily the promulgating and solidifying of liberatory messages. So I very much agree with Charlton that the sort of cooperative mutual aid community aspect is often missing. But if you think about the promulgation of messages and the solidifying of messages, these spaces have been fairly effective for that. Um, what can get lost in the story of the data, and I think some, we saw some of this with the conversation earlier this week, is that while Twitter eventually became a place that was overrepresented by political and media elites, um, this was primarily the result of the interventions of grassroots political and cultural um, things that were happening online. The reason that suddenly at one point journalists, advertisers, academics, flooded to Twitter was because something was happening among the sort of original set of folks, many of whom came from the blogosphere, where there was a lot tighter intimacies and a lot closer understandings of, of who people were and what their relations to one another were. They were doing something that was relevant enough that it became a story, it became interesting, and it became something that people wanted to capitalize off of. Um, so of course, this has, you know, um, um, this is why I think Twitter was dead before Elon Musk, because I think that very much changed. And I, you know, there were problems with Twitter early on. I'm not idealizing the first versions of Twitter at all, and I'll say a little more about that, but I do think it was a different space um, that offered something that looked like a potential. Um, okay, so this question about access to the API, it, it obviously intervenes in our ability to study this question, particularly longitudinally and over time to see how these spaces shift and when and how and under what conditions they have more versus less potential. But I will also say that as somebody who relied entirely on the Twitter API um, to write a book, um, that I think our dependence as scholars on access to corporate social media platforms like Twitter through something like the API has really kneecapped the development of scholarship um, on data and inequality and social movements in general. And so one of the most obvious examples is, is a, a neglected the study of alternative platforms, like many of the platforms that have um, been developed to try to be alternative and more collaborative and collective spaces because they're not as easy to collect data on, because as they're, they're not as high profile, because they don't have as many elite users, like there's much less research on those platforms. And so we actually don't have a lot of data to tell us how these these platforms are working. But even other corporate platforms um, like Reddit, like YouTube and like Instagram, which rely on different types of models of user engagement and in some cases, you know, different models of, of, of consumerism um, and, and economics have been neglected in the study of social media um, because they're harder to study. Um, so I think one of the things, and just, just to to switch here a little bit is that I, Charlton mentioned that we were in this conversation recently um, 
at this Black Twitter Summit, which there's a lot to say about. But um, <laughs> one of the things that I think it, uh, was interesting to me um, is that um, we continue to face the issue of access to the public sphere vis-a-vis -vis elite and corporate platforms, um, despite the fact that we saw early on a successful network waged by the Zapatistas. I hope there are people in the room who like have studied this, right? Um, and their allies that included a global grassroots network of hackers, activists, journalists, um, including the Association for Progressive Communications. And um, part of this, of course, is about uh, you know, the nature of economics, of, of media systems, but ec economics more generally outside of media industries. Um, you know, people have to pay their bills and, and want some freedom from economic constraints. But what was really interesting about that event that we were at is that several of the people who attended um, were um, early designers and engineers of the technologies that became Twitter technologies. And those folks shared with me, sort of, they pulled me aside afterwards and said, you know, we actually started um, designing these technologies because we were part of the Association for Progressive Communication. We were supporting the Zapatista movement. We were part of the battle in Seattle. Our politics and our hearts very much um, lie in that space. And so they entered into tech spaces with those skills and those sort of liberatory politics and ideals. And then um, at some point, they were bought out. <laughs> Right, um, the technologies that developed, the, the things they were working on, were bought out by people whose ideals could be more easily translated to the venture capitalists who f fund everything that becomes big in Silicon Valley, and so the idealism, right, the idea of changing the world stayed, which I think is where you know why so many Silicon Valley people are, are these techno optimists, but the politics changed, right, um, which is obviously you know. I think why it's often so hard to have conversations about this with people in, in the tech industry. Um, so I think I will, I will pause there. I had a couple other things that I wanted to talk about in terms of um, the agency of users and thinking through some of the questions that my fellow panelists raised about the systems and governance, and but also thinking about like what those things mean for how people experience um, these spaces. But I think I'll stop there for now, and we can talk more about that in the Q and A. Okay, so we have about half an hour for discussion. Um, I'm happy to jump in and take my role as moderator to start us off. But uh, does anyone in the crowd have a burning question or comment? Um, thank you all so much for this uh, really wonderful and engaging set of um, conversations and provocations. One thing that strikes me, and I feel like it's a consistent theme throughout all of these um, papers, is this question of um, has social media ever or should it have ever uh, been our model for serving the needs of a multiracial democratic society? Because I feel like every, every paper here has in some way said it never should have and it failed if it did. Um, so I guess my provocation or my question to each of the panelists are, uh, if it's not in online spaces, um, Nathan, as you mentioned, um, that online spaces have a limitation. Um, they don't give us this, the tools and the structures that we need either for self-governance or for uh, achieving a democratic society online and democratic organization. So where should we be looking to to create those spaces? If not in online spaces, is, that, is it something that we should look to in offline spaces um, or other forms of organizing? You can start us off if you like, Nathan. Yeah, um, thank, thank you for that. And, you know, I, I um, appreciate you uh, uh, bringing up the Malcolm Gladwell uh, article uh, because it, you know, it, it, at the time I was a social movement reporter and, and it was just deeply, you know, I feel like those debates have, have you know, were just so woven into, um, into so many of the questions I was trying to wrap my head around in, you know, a decade ago, um, and still today. Um, you know, I found the, 
the kind of, I think of as the update for the Malcolm Gladwell piece uh, in uh, Zainab Tufekshi's Twitter and Tear Gas, where she offers this distinction between uh, signal and capacity, which I found just so illuminating. And so, you know, it's a very simple distinction, and, you know, every simple distinction has its problems. But, um, but I was wrestling for so many years about how did these movements in the Arab Spring, 2011, and then in Occupy, which I, I you know, wrote a book about, um, succeed so well at causing disruption and fail so miserably at maintaining power, at translating the disruption into a transition. You know, the, the Facebook liberals of Tahrir Square, you know, contribute to a disruption. The Muslim Brotherhood gets elected, right? Um, uh, because the Muslim Brotherhood had real durable political power. And, and that is part of, for instance, what led me into being, getting deeply interested in the cooperative movement. How have social movements in the past built durable political power? And I had conversations with civil rights elders who talked about setting up credit unions as part of their voting rights work, right? And you know, look to anti-colonial movements that saw cooperative economics as vital to their strategy. Um, and, and that's why, for instance, today, I'm very interested in where we can and can't build durable power uh, online, partly because I think it is essential to, to translating the, the, signal capac the signal making abilities of social media, which I think are really important, into power shifting um, uh, opportunities. We need to be able to self-govern. We need to be able to um, uh, to hold organizations, to hold economic capacity in order to make good on the powerful messages and hashtags uh, that we produce. And, and so, you know, diagnosing that, that question about social, social movements, I think, brings, brings me at least to these questions of political economy and the questions of ownership and governance of, of platforms. Yeah, I'm, I'm much more comfortable talking about the past and the future. Um, but I think one of the things that I, is, is problematic as we do look towards the future, number one, I think, is folks that assume that the model forward is replicating the existing model, which is a building of platforms and communities that are fundamentally profit-based. Um, and so the idea is, let's have other communities build similar things for the same ends. And there's a part of me that believes that. I believe that black people should have the opportunity to make a shitload of money off the same tools that other people have. Um, but I don't know that that is a viable um, way forward if um, some of these ideas about community, about governance, and so forth are really uh, to be viable and transformative. Um, I think one of the uh, one of the transitions I wrote about in in my book Black Software was very telling in this regard, and that was the move from uh, BBS world, pre-internet, um, Afronet, very thriving black um, community, online community, digital community um, that became the model for. CompuServe, AOL, et cetera, that is, when they were looking for how we're going to use this new tool, this new thing called the internet, um, that's where they went looking for their model of uh, what can this thing be good for. Um, and it was at that moment when they approached folks uh, from Afronet to say, hey, can you come run this for us? And they said, yes, if we can run it and we make the money. And CompuServe, nah, that's, that's not the idea we had. <laughs> Um, and it, it ended um, both Afronet and CompuServe's um, ability to produce a thriving uh, community of any kind. Um, AOL got a little bit, uh, got it right a little bit better because it had uh, a group of, of folks um, with Net Noir uh, to uh, incubate a similar type of community that was profit driven, very successful. Um, but it just seems clear that the, uh, if there were ever an ideal of digital communities, um, that ideal uh, died with the introduction and realization of a profit model. 
uh, a financial model of how to really um, benefit financially from these types of platforms and technology. So I think that's where the break has to be. Um, I'll just add on this question of um, building or striving to build a multiracial democracy that I'm not sure that technology needs to be central to that conversation at all. Um, and what I mean by that is that, I mean, obviously I think probably those of us on this panel at least concur that the current economic models of um, media in general, tech, but probably the world more broadly aren't conducive with building a fully multiracial democracy. And I think that's a broader issue to address than just what's happening within this digital spaces. Um, but I'll also say that one of the one of the things that I often see that I very much think falls into that category of techno determinism that I mentioned is that people have gotten so used to the idea that tech can be a fix that even people who cr critique tech, their next idea is to propose new tech to fix the tech that they're critiquing. Um, and we've seen over and over again ways in which that fundamentally fails and actually make thing, makes things worse. So one of the most recent examples is that there are, are courts all over the country that have started to use algorithmic sentencing procedures that have been advertised and sold to justice departments and to states as less bias in terms of sentencing and as something that will get rid of the inequality in sentencing that is built in around you know, race and class and gender, et cetera. And guess what? It doesn't work because people build algorithms, people build the tech. There's all sorts of ways in which it actually removes the potential of humanizing um, folks in, in, in those spaces and in the justice system. Um, and so I think I would just say that Part of my response to that is, I think there's a broader provocation here about building multi <laughs> multiracial democracy that is outside of um, even, but inclusive of these critiques that we're levying around the digital and around technology. Okay, I wanna open it up to the crowd. Um, we've got one question over here, go ahead. to um, enact uh, harmful discrimination um, in order to bypass the Civil Rights Act. And was thinking about the move that's just been made this year in the Philadelphia school system to try to bypass uh, some of the inequities and racial discriminations for magnet schools of using a lottery that uses zip code preferences uh, to try and kind of bypass uh, what uh, some of the fears about clamps down on affirmative action and things like that are. So I'm interested in like whether the use of the term evil uh, is evenly applied to any use of that type of navigation and strategy around laws, uh, or if it's uh, something that's appropriate in a particular case. And I'm also interested in where universities fit into this question with the rise of platforms like Coursely, which is the one that Penn has just signed on to, or CourseDog, that are explicitly talking about single integrated systems of clamping down and streamlining education, making education more efficient, getting input from industries, and algorithmically profiling students to uh, find self-same pathways through the university. And it seems like what's being shut out is faculty governance, dispute, uh, the slow process of debate about what's, what counts, what's a requirement, all those things. And so it seems like we're implicated in what's happening here in our own governance systems. And I'm just wondering how we navigate like this jostle between embodied community and the platforms that we get us, that are often so constraining. Two really thoughtful and provocative questions. On the first, I probably misspoke a little bit. So, you know, oftentimes disparate impact isn't necessarily the product of any exclusionary 
racist or misogynistic intent. And in many cases, the, the relevant decision makers believe they're fairly administering a system using objective criteria. And I think the history of credit scoring in the United States is very revealing. So credit scores were developed, I think, in the late 60s, early 1970s. And the idea was we would replace uh, subjective decisions on credit with these objective scores that looked at people's income, people's history of making payments on time. And the, the aspiration of the proponents was, well, left to local loan officers, these decisions are often very subjective. They gave credits to their, they extended credit to their friends, people who look like them, while withholding credit from people who were different from them. Uh, the, the results were often uh, racist uh, allocations of credit. Uh, and credit scoring was seen as a way, well, we can get over this. We can offer loan officers objective criteria. They can give a credit card to someone who has a credit score over 750 while withholding credit card from someone whose credit score doesn't reach that threshold. Uh, the unfortunate reality is credit scoring didn't address the underlying inequalities and injustices in American society. It's a pattern of slavery, Jim Crow, genocide. And so by shifting to this objective measure, they were in some ways limiting the discretion of, you know, you could say local racists, but repeating and perpetuating the existing inequalities in the United States. So credit scores are correlated with what you might imagine, income, uh, being white, being older. So what was presented as an objective neutral measure was actually just reflecting and repeating existing inequalities in the United States. So you know, disparate impact is in many ways much more insidious because you don't have that, you don't have that local bigot making decisions based on his racial prejudice. Instead, you have a system that seems scientific on the surface that's actually doing the same thing on a much larger scale. And it just reminds us that racism is structural. It's not about bad individuals and weeding out those bad individuals. It's about fundamentally addressing the distribution of wealth and income in the country. Uh, so I hope that answers your first question. On the second question, I, I can't speak ne specifically to tech that's being adopted by universities, but an interesting feature of so much of the tech discourse is what's presented to the public is this new shiny app or service. Like we can do things more efficiently, effectively, more objectively in the case of credit scoring. But what's often happening is governance is being taken out of the hands of certain people and uh, assumed or maybe even usurped by others. So I think Uber is a really good example. Uh, 20 years ago, cab markets were regulated at the local level by municipal cab commissions. Some of these bodies were elected, others were appointed, but they decided the criteria uh, for who would be a cab driver. You had to maybe maybe not have a criminal record, might have uh, not had any accidents in recent times. And then they also set rates. Uh, if you're a cab driver, you had to charge a certain rate that those rates were transparent. You know, the list tariffs on the window of cabs, I know that all feels very anachronistic. Then Uber comes in and says, we're just going to disrupt what, in their view, was a dysfunctional market. And it was dysfunctional in some ways. But the end result was, yes, we could hail cabs using an app, but governance now belonged to uh, Travis Kalanick and his VC backers rather than local municipal cab boards. And so when we're talking about tech, often we're really talking about displacement of existing governance structures with new generally financialized systems of control. And it's not to idealize what exists right now, but I think it's important to be clear-eyed about what's really happening. It's not about the app, but about who wields power. If I can just add something to that. I mean, I think the cab example is a really useful example to the larger point I think you're making and I was making about how these systems are also sort of above tech which is that part of, I know, in cities like Philadelphia and DC and Boston, um, where I lived when Uber became the thing that everybody relied on, was that for people of color who were frequently being discriminated against by cab drivers, because those drivers would either see them and keep driving, or hear where the neighborhood was they were going to and decide they didn't want to take the ride, these things were revelatory because they got picked up and taken home, right? And that 
the sort of governance systems built in to what cab drivers were doing before around the rates, around the economies of that were great, but there was also a gap about who had access to that resource and how, what people's experience with that resource was even before, which in many ways I think these, these tech folks preyed upon. Mm -hmm. You know, they really preyed upon that. Um, and I won't, I'm not saying that they saw that or that, you know, Uber and Lyft drivers have any fewer personal biases than cab drivers do or whatever, but it certainly became the popular discourse um, that that was an example of a tech solution, right, to an offline or to a, to a non-tech problem, which really we just haven't solved and it didn't solve. I thought I might add something um, because you, your, your second question spoke to um, what I deal with most days uh, in my day job as a vice provost and one who has, um, as part of my portfolio, our um, procurement of a lot of our data systems, mostly on the faculty side, but also some on the uh, student side and so forth. And so, um, so I, I live through this sort of every day, and I think, number one, um, it, it sort of tests your mettle um, and, uh, and allegiance to these kinds of principles that we believe in when you have a very strong um, imperative uh, working for the institution on behalf of the institution for many of these things. And so the conflict um, there is real and, uh, you know, finding myself at times saying, you know, we need everyone at this university on this platform um, and thinking, I never thought I would say something like that. <laughs> um, and so I, I, I'll say two things. Um, number one, I think that by and large, and I've had this conversation with a lot of colleagues across higher ed institutions, I think the, the gap between where we are now and the day of using a lot of our data capability um, in some of these kind of predictive ways, some of these uh, ways that we're most fearful of, I think is still a little bit of the ways off. Um, I think most of the kinds of staff uh, able to do that are not present in the um, offices where that kind of work would go and where the uh, repositories of that data um, live. Um, so I'm not fearful today about that, um, but the time is quickly coming. Um, and so I know that one of the things that we've done at my institution recently is um, we've hired a staff of about 25 lawyers um, who work in the area of sort of trust, safety, privacy, protection, et cetera, mostly getting ready for what we expect to be the storm coming, that is really um, more and more vendors with stuff to sell to institutions that have a very real imperative. I think mostly on the student side where outcomes uh, uh, really have a profit um, uh, or, are, or are a profit driver for so many things. Um, so I think it's an interesting landscape. I won't say too much more about that, but, um, but uh, it's coming. I think we have time for one more question. Yeah, go ahead. Without changing the system to a socialist system, he said, he felt it was hard. Cooperatives didn't work. And I obviously made me think, because we're all trying to think about what is the model that needs to be built, right? Is a capitalist model going to work for a new media infrastructure, for, especially for black folks and people of color, right? Is it going to ever cap Can we actually have a capitalist system and democratize anything? You know? Um, you know, the current form of democracy is less than 60, 60 years old if one count voting as a form of like, you know, the health of a, of a country. So what's your thoughts on that? Like, it, um, on, um, on cooperatives within the, within the capitalist system? Um, was the, you know, just, you know, hearing that sound clip, you know, obviously is discouraging. 
you know. <laughs> but I just wanted to get your thoughts, you know. I don't, I'm going to let these folks talk about cooperatives, but I appreciate the question because I was just at a conference last weekend where people were talking about Du Bois, and I, inter I said, you all know he was a socialist, right? And everyone was like, what? So thanks for that question. Yeah, I, I, again, I, I, I'm so glad you, you um, raised his name. You know, his vision of, of abolition democracy is something that I think is so powerful, this insistence that true abolition requires not just the elimination of something, but the construction of democratic apparatus that, that enables people to, uh, to participate fully and economically. And that was, he was such a tremendous uh, leader in the cooperative movement. You know, in my book on cooperatives, I drew on, you know, data he collected over a century earlier and um, on, on cooperatives and across black cooperatives across the country and including in Colorado where I live and um, it's a tremendous uh, legacy. Um, I, I think it's, you know, it's, I, I don't think it's an, it, it works to, to, to draw such a, such a strong distinction um, around capitalism because every economy is mixed and every economy is complex. Um, you know, there are socialist countries that have developed cooperative systems that on paper look like a lot more cooperative stuff happening, but in practice are really state-run companies. Um, and so I, I don't think changing the system is, is the, um, you know, is the simple solution. And in the United States, I think a lot of us, you know, neglect the legacies like what Sandeep is, uh, you know, writes about in his, in his new book, this really astonishing achievement that uh, cooperatives have achieved. For instance, in, you know, in, the, in the 1930s, driven by social movements going back to the 1880s, the, the populist movement um, you know, achieved a solution to rural electrification within a decade or two. Um, credit unions that significantly shifted access to uh, financial services. Um, when we create frameworks for capitalizing cooperative enterprise, it works. In 1974, we uh, passed a uh, law through, slipped into the retirement law, ERISA, uh, to enable people to buy out companies where they work uh, without putting a cent of their own money in. And very quickly, you had tens of, you know, over 10 million people becoming employee owners. Um, uh, uh, and there's some really interesting data coming out of the work on Rutgers about what that has done around um, around um, uh, closing racial wealth gaps and so forth. The, the, this is, you know, we, when we put our minds to and our and put power behind achieving the infrastructure we need to to shift the economy to some degree and maybe to gr ever greater degrees away from control by investor ownership toward control, the opening doors for control by. Um, by cooperative ownership, we have actually been wildly successful. It has worked. It can happen. You know, it's not perfect. Those rural electric cooperatives, they're, they're a mixed bag. But there are ways of cleaning that up, and, and, and the achievement is still very, very real. So I think it's, I think I enter into this stuff with a historical perspective that says, oh, we've done this before. We can do it. When, when we run into walls, like I do all the time working with people founding new co-ops, um, I, 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 history teaches me that those walls are, um, you know, are, are, are made by a system uh, that, that constrains this kind of development that doesn't have to, you know, that we have done this before. Thank you so much for that question. I'm really glad this issue came up. So if you bring any group of people together, uh, especially people from different walks of life, you'll be able to find that a group can provide the necessary you know, intellectual labor, physical labor, managerial skills to engage in some type of collective activity. What's usually missing is they don't have the necessary physical or digital tokens that we call money. So I think finance is really the bottleneck to building uh, multiracial democracy, which we've never had. I mean, if we build it, it would be the first time it's existed. And I mean democracy in everyday life, not simply casting a ballot every other November. 
And that requires rethinking finance and recognizing that granting banks, uh, private banks, is near monopoly on the allocation of credit is a policy choice. It's a political choice. Mm -hmm. uh, the government is ultimately the source of dollars, whether it's the Treasury spending money into existence or the Federal Reserve bailing out Silicon Valley Bank. And I think Silicon Valley Bank is a really telling example because it showed the public character of banking and money creation. It's now the Federal Bank of Santa Clara Valley, right? <laughs> <laughs> That's right. So you have these institutions chartered by the government, backstopped by the government. In, in this case, the government said, well, yeah, technically there's a $250,000 cap on deposit insurance, but some really rich people's money is at stake, so we're just going to remove that cap. And the logical question is, well, if the government is so intimately intertwined in banking, why do we even have these middlemen? You know, people are getting fabulously wealthy in, off of banking. Why do we have this system? Why don't we have more institutions like the Rural Electrification Administration, which wasn't perfect. Like, even the New Deal at its best is only a half measure. But it said, we will give you low-cost credit to electrify your communities. Why do we have more institutions like that? We have the Small Business Administration today, also very imperfect. But we should be thinking about the public allocation of credit. And we should think beyond credit. Uh, loans and debt have their own shortcomings and pathologies. We should be talking about grants, uh, giving people money to undertake certain socially beneficial activities. And what's positive is you know, the Inflation Reduction Act is a very mixed bag. There are things that are very problematic about it. But it does recognize that the government, is the federal government specifically, is a source of dollars and says, we're going to spend hundreds of, mil hundreds of billions of dollars to decarbonize uh, US society over the next 10 years. It's not everything, but it's the nucleus of something more radical and democratic. I know we're out of time. I just want to add, because I know you, Joseph, and I know you'll nerd out with me on this, is that um, there are also lots of social movement organizations that have turned to this exact idea that even under the current system, there are all these opportunities for mixed forms of economies. And one that I like to shout out is the New Economy Coalition, which is based in Boston, Massachusetts. And they, as uh, you know, there's a list of them, but they're one of many organizations that are very, very rooted in, you know, grassroots organizing and thinking through these questions and very much thinking through how to build these exact kinds of often hyper local, cooperative, community centered economies that can coexist. And every one that you build is a shift, right? So. Indeed, we have come to the end of the panel. Uh, please welcome, uh, please join me in um, thanking our panelists. <laughs>